Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was terrible. This isn't Forest Lawn. <laughs> this is the Nethercut Collection. Good morning. Good morning. That was a scotch better. <laughs> Welcome to the Nethercut Collection, folks. My name is Kyle Irwin. I'm the curator of the collection, and I'm also the master technician for all of the mechanical musical instruments, the clocks, and the watches. So my job is to find the instruments and the pieces for the family, and I'm the one that rebuilds them, restores them, maintains them. Then I get the thrill of playing them for you when you come to see us. We also have with us Robert back there and Bill over here, and they're two of our wonderful volunteers. These guys give up their time on a volunteer basis. We call them docents here, and they help us out on a volunteer basis. So hopefully the three of us can answer most of your questions, but here's one for you. How many of you are here for the first time? <laughs> wow, welcome. And how many of you have never been here before? <laughs> Works every time. You're stuck with me for two hours, so let's have some fun, okay? What you're about to see, folks, are the combined collections of the Nethercut family. The founders were J.B. and Dorothy Nethercutt. The Nethercutt family are also the owners of Merle Norman Cosmetics. So if you were curious as to what made all of this possible, <laughs> it was cosmetics. Ah. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> there is a theme that runs throughout the entire collection, and that theme is functional fine art. In other words, everything here works. Every car does have gas, water, and oil, and as you see, the keys are in the ignition, and don't get any ideas. <laughs> they are all serviced and driven at least once a year. We do take them out right out from the ramp and up the street, drive them around the neighborhood. The cars that are capable, we do take onto the 210 freeway. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> We actually got the Duesenberg SJ, which you'll see in just a moment, up to 110 on the freeway. Designed for strength and power, folks. Duesenberg invented supercharged engines. That was their invention. It was exhilarating to get it up that fast, but it took me an hour to slow it down. <laughs> the clocks and watches here all keep time, and the musical instruments, as you've heard, they all play. So lots to sh show you this morning. Because of the ridiculously cold weather, we are going to stay the inside route, We're going to, which does involve stairs. We do have an elevator. It's across the room that direction. And Robert is your personal elevator operator for the next two hours. We're going to spoil you while you're here. Are you ready to start our adventure into the collection? Yes. yes. You're only in the garage. Come on up. <laughs> Follow me into the center of the room, folks, directly into the center. Come on in. Our subtle little display area. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Yes. What does this room remind you of? What does it look like to you? Old Hollywood. Old Hollywood. Now that's a first. <laughs> Palace. Ballroom is actually the number one answer. But the best answer I've ever gotten? <laughs> Money. <laughs> what it's meant to look like, folks, is an automobile showroom of the teens, 20s, and 30s. Yeah. When you went shopping for high-end cars, Lincolns, Packards, Cadillacs, 
Duesenbergs. You walked into showrooms just like this. Even in Los Angeles, down at Wilshire Boulevard, we get showrooms like this. Beneath your feet are two rare marbles. The black is from Italy, the green is from Vermont. The rouge on the columns came all the way from Africa. The cars, aren't they beautiful? They really are works of art. You wouldn't lose any one of these in the mall lot, would you? <laughs> well, they're really pretty now, but this is not how many of them arrived here. Quite a few of these arrived as rusted out piles of junk. Unrecognized most what they were one time or what they could be again. Many of them were considered barn finds, field finds. If you've ever seen the television show American Pickers, this is what they search for. <laughs> Abandoned forgotten relics left to dissolve into time. But what's important for us, is this car worthy of being saved, worthy of being retrieved, worthy of restoration? Can we ever drive it again? And most importantly, what color was she? <laughs> we have our own staff of automobile craftsmen. When a car like this is chosen for restoration by Mr. Nethercutt himself, it is thoroughly researched before we ever touch it. It's stripped down to the frame. Every part, every piece is removed, researched again and again, and then they are meticulously restored to as new condition. This is how they looked when they were new, folks. We wouldn't be one of the finest collections in the world if we over-restored or exaggerated a restoration. It takes us a year to two years just on one car. And there's only three things we don't do here at Silmar. We do not do any of the chrome or nickel plating. This car is all nickel. We don't make tires and we don't make glass. But everything else is done here. We do it, a hood, a frame, a fender, all of the upholstery, electrical. It's all done here on site, on the other side of this very wall. Now, our restorations even include the correct colors. Are you surprised at the colors you've seen this morning? Look at this. Look at the Goldenrod Packard 1934 down there. These are all historically correct colors. Most people assume, including myself, that these old cars were probably dark or black. But there's two really good reasons why. The first, black and white movies. Black and white photography. Any of these, one of these cars wouldn't look black or gray. Now, car guys and gals, and I know there's a lot of you, and again, a wonderful welcome to the Corvette Club that's here today. We're honored to have you. And the Alfa Romeos are here as well, still across the street, yes. Help me out. What was Henry Ford's favorite expression? You can have any color you like, as long as it's black. Well, it was a ripple effect, but yeah. <laughs> you can have any color you want, as long as it's black. But do you know why Henry Ford chose the color black? They drive faster. Say it again. Paint drive faster. It drives faster. Oh. There's something about the chemical makeup of the color black still to this day and the pigment that sets and cures faster than any other color. No one really knows why. And it was less expensive, not cheaper. No. There's a difference. But Henry Ford, folks, was only one man, one company. Between 1895 and 1947, in the United States alone, hmm, get ready, there were 4,774 makes of cars. Fact. And one of the ways they were able to stand out and compete, color. These are all historically correct colors. And yes, metallic was available then as well. Metallic was called opalescence. It was made from crushed abalone shells, crushed fish skins and scales, multiple coats of lacquer, considerable drying time, so it was very expensive. Sadly, it faded almost overnight. But yes, you could get metallic. After almost two years of thorough restoration, when she finally came out of the restoration bay, here she is right now. One of the same. 1934, 12-cylinder Sport Phaeton Packard. Five were made. One was destroyed. So there's only four left in the world. Now again, we take every one of these cars out onto the roads. This is the car we got up to 110 on the freeway, folks. Designed for it. 
Duesenberg's claim to fame was 0 to 104 in second year alone, and it was factual. If you're curious as what the engine looks like, we have a spare. <laughs> and it's right there on the block, so you can walk all the way around and see Duesenberg's straight eight supercharged engine. Now, I'm going to point out three cars. Oh, in addition to taking them out and competing with them, we take them out for lunch, too. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. <laughs> you cannot imagine the look on her face at Del Taco when I pulled through the ride. <laughs> I'm not kidding, we actually did it, folks. <laughs> so I'm going to point out three cars and then I'm going to let you loose on them. The Nethercut collection started in 1956. The Nethercuts were driving around downtown Los Angeles on a Sunday, just a leisurely drive, and they drove by an old filling station. We call them gas stations now. In the back of the filling station was a very amateur used car lot. One car really stuck out, and it was in worse shape than Hussey. It was a 1930 DuPont town car, a rare car to find on the West Coast. He bought it for $500, that was a lot. Well, unbeknownst to him, it took him over 18 months and cost him over $63,000 to restore. And in August of 1958, the Nethercuts loaded the car up and they actually drove it up the coast of California to Monterey, and that's not an easy drive. But they landed in Monterey to compete at the world renowned Pebble Beach, Concorde d'Elegance, the number one car show in the world. At their first time there, <laughs> best in show. <laughs> there is no higher award in the world, folks, than a Pebble Beach best in show. And we've won more awards at Pebble, including six best in shows, which is four more than any other collector in its history. We have more best in shows, first place, second place, third place, best open vehicle, best luxury vehicle, best everything vehicle <laughs> than any other collection. We are the number one winner. And the car that started it all, folks, is right here in black. 1930 DuPont Town Car, our very first restoration, and our first of dozens upon dozens, upon dozens of Best in Show awards. That is the 1958 restoration. It's not been touched up since, but it still drives like a new car today. Now, a couple of you have already asked, are we still restoring, are we static, or a stagnant collection? You bet we're on the ball, folks. Our Bugatti just left late last night to a car show in Arizona. So yes, we're always on the move. But our latest restoration was finished just prior to this horrific pandemic that we've all been suffering through. So not very many people got to see it, and it's on display today. So you're one of the first groups to see it. And she's right there in the middle of the room. Careful, the paint might still be wet. <laughs> 1932 Maybach Zeppelin. Very, uh, quite a few of them were made in the 30s, but only a handful exist today. It was named after the great airships in Germany, the Zeppelins. We call them Blitz here in the United States. It was named after its power, strength, and beauty. It was commissioned for an English driver, as you see the steering wheel is on the right. It was confiscated by the Nazis. Start of World War I, they didn't borrow, they took, they stole what they wanted. And they used it quite a bit throughout the war, and then it was abandoned in a farm in Poland, Warsaw. And it was left to rot. Again, it was in worse shape than Hussey here. It was all a barrier, three to four feet of mud and silk, and they had vegetation growing out of it. Mr. Nethercutt moved the car because of its car history, not its war history, and he legally purchased it from the rancher that owned but the Communist Party would not allow us to take it out from behind the Iron Curtain. That didn't stop us. We smuggled it out in the middle of the night, got it to a neutral country, shipped it to the United States, and this is its second restoration. We chose to bring it back to its original color scheme, which is black on black. I'm going to open her up so you can see it. Wait till you smell that leather. It perfumes the room in a matter of seconds. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the premier car of the Nethercut collection, the automobile that people come from all over the world to see, and just to have the thrill of standing next to you, is right here. 1933, Arlington Torpedo Sedan, Duesenberg. Duesenberg is an American car. How many of you thought the Duesenberg was from Germany? Be honest. I did too, because of the name. Yeah. 
It comes from that very famous and historically German town, Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> it's an American car. And to, these day, to this day, the great Duesenbergs are still the finest cars ever made on American soil. This beauty was made specifically as a show car for the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And at the fair, Duesenberg was asked to put a price tag on his masterpiece. He did. 20 grand. $20,000. Folks, you could buy a home here in <coughs> Beverly Hills, Encino, Sherman Oaks, San Marino, La Cunada, Flint Ridge, that same year for $1,500. <laughs> <laughs> $1,500. So twenty thousand for a car. It took two years to sell. It sold at the end of the fair in nineteen thirty-five to a man named Shreve Archer, Archer Daniels Midland, ADM, a company still in business today. He drastically altered it when he got it. He removed the fenders, the, the uh, spares, and the running boards, and then painted it black. Yeah. Well, no one really knows why. It didn't make sense, but it would have left it looking more like a roadster or rail because of the exposed exhaust. Five owners later, we acquired it in the late, late 1970s. It didn't look anything like this, and it still was painted black and with a green vinyl interior. It was nasty, but st still pretty. So we searched for him, and everything you know electronically would not exist for decades, folks. So thousands of phone calls, handwritten letters, teletypes were sent all over the world to find him, and we did. The original designer of this car Mr. Gordon Buer, he was living in New York, he was in his 90s, and that wonderful gentleman still had his original files, folders, and paint codes oh for his masterpiece. So we shipped him out to Silmar, and he worked alongside us step by step to restore his masterpiece to his original design specification and color. And he lived to see his beauty premiere twice. It's the only one ever made, folks. This is one of the most sought after cars in the entire world, the infamous 20 grand Duesenberg. And you've all heard that old expression, it's a doozy, here she is. <laughs> now I'm gonna give you that time to look around as you do, we'll have some beautiful music serenading you from our mechanical piano at the top of the stairs. You are more than welcome to go up and watch the piano play and that's a phenomenal panoramic shot for you photographers as well. As you see, my friends, these cars are very close together, and there's a lot of you here today. So be very careful of rings, watches, jewelry, anything that might come in contact with the cars. Gentlemen, make sure that there are no keys, ropes, lanyards, chains, strings, anything hanging off your waist, because they're the same height as the fenders of these cars. Ladies, turn your handbags towards your body so the metal is away from the car. We want you to get that close. We're in winter wear, so be very careful of zippers, buttons, anything that might come in contact. I do see quite a few metal water bottles. Those are our worst nightmare. When they fall, they destroy a car's finish. So those of you that have your metal water bottles, keep them either in directly in front of you or in back of you uh, until we disallow them here. Just be, keep them under control. They can do major damage, okay? I'm also going to open up 20 grand so you can see inside, smell the interior, sense the interior, just don't touch the interior. And don't miss the back seat because it's prettier than the front. I'll be around if you have any questions, folks. Welcome to our collection. Have fun looking around. How much is that car worth today? A lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most recent car that brought to the Nethercut collection. It was discussed earlier. A 1932 Maybach. Video just doesn't do it justice, but if you could smell through video the new car smell of that leather coming out of the car is amazing in this room. I highly 
recommend that if you have a chance to come down to Silmar, California, that you take advantage of this Nethercut Museum. It's an amazing collection. And look at this. Look at that dash beam. Beautiful. Beautiful car. That's not vinyl. And here it is, the 20 grand. Amazing. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. They really are works of art. Okay, here's a little car history and a trivia question, which every one of you better know the answer. You will. The automobile was invented in 1886 in Germany. Two men who lived miles apart. They never met. They did not know each other. And within days, possibly a week, both men invented the first gasoline-powered car. I am emphasizing gasoline because steam vehicles have been around for 200 years before the gasoline car. Her Majesty Queen Marie Antoinette actually had a steam carriage at Versailles in the 1600s. So those two men that invented the gasoline car were Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler. Two names we still know today, Benz and Daimler. They were the inventors of the first car, therefore they could put the steering wheel wherever they wanted to put it. <coughs> and both men put it <laughs> in the center. <laughs> when the American automobile came around 10 years later, we were late in the car game. There were over a thousand cars on the streets of Paris alone. Two brothers back at Springfield, Mass, invented the American gasoline car. Do any of you know who those two brothers were? No, it was not Dodge. <laughs> the Duryea brothers. Ah, a name most people have long forgotten or were never taught. Isn't that unfortunate? <laughs> the American car was invented by the Duryea brothers, and we have a Duryea over across the street. It's a magnificent automobile. It's really beautiful. Second aisle, about eight, nine cars down on the south side. And since it was their invention, they could put the steering wheel wherever they wanted to put it. And they put it on the right. So in fact, the first American cars were right-hand drive. When Henry Ford came around years later, Ford was late in the car game, folks. 1903. For Ford's reasons, he put his steering wheel on the left. Now here's your trivia question. You'll all know it. Who built the first mass-produced car, the first assembly line automobile? Ford. No. <laughs> Trick question. It was not Henry Ford. Any other guesses? No. No. Not GM. <laughs> Security. Are you ready? It was Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile, 1901. Two years before Ford ever sold a car, the 1901 Curve Dash Olds was the very first mass produced assembly line automobile. Henry Ford's moving assembly line mechanized didn't show up for 12 years after the fact, 1913. So the billions of books and the gazillion stories and what's still taught in school is not the truth. It was Oldsmobile. So the automobile industry continued both here and abroad where the steering wheels were placed wherever they wanted to put them. It had nothing to do with the British colonies, United Kingdom, Japan, China, or the United States. The steering wheels were all over. So in 1922, the American government intervened for safety reasons. 
So from 1922 on, all American cars would be driven on the right, steered from the left, for one reason, passenger safety. When the driver pulls up to the curb, your passengers exit on the sidewalk. It's one of the few laws that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one, huh? The clock predates the American automobile. It was built in 1890 by the Durfee Company of Providence, Rhode Island. It is an American clock, and it was commissioned to be built by none other than Louis Comfort Tiffany. It is a genuine Tiffany grandfather clock, and sold out of Tiffany's Fifth Avenue store in New York in 1893. It is hand-carved out of one block of Cuban mahogany. That is one piece of wood. The portraits, portraits above the piano are Mr. J.B. and Dorothy. Now they've got the founders of the collection and also co-founders and contributors to Merle Norman Cosmetics. J.B. was born in 1913 in South Bend, Indiana. When he was nine, his mother passed away. His father sent him out to Los Angeles to live with and to be raised by his aunt. Here's the tie-in. J.B. Nethercutt's aunt was Merle Nethercutt Norman. That's a nephew. Merle Norman was developing cosmetics in her kitchen in the 20s and selling them out her store in her, her kitchen window in Santa Monica. So in 1931, she opened her first store in Santa Monica, California, still going strong today, 92 years later, with over a thousand stores all over the world. JB mastered in chemistry in school, so it was a perfect bond with his aunt, and they developed the cosmetics, the skincare, and the company <coughs> together. In 1962, Merle Norman retired. JB bought her out, and he owned the company till his passing in 2004. Both Mr. and Mrs. Ann left us in 04 at ages 90 and 91, and they were married for 71 years. They had two sons. The younger is retired, the elder is the current president and CEO, along with his wife, and he was just here teaching his eldest grandchildren how to drive these cars. As you car guys and gals know, you have to be trained to drive these old cars. You don't get behind the wheel of any one of these and start texting. <laughs> Look at the guilty faces. That 1913 Mercedes over there is a chain-driven automobile. Left and right chain drive. Therefore, it has five foot pedals, unmarked, and one is for the left side, the other is for the right side. So it is independent side braking. So if you hit the wrong pedal, you're gonna spin in circles. <laughs> I did it. It was really funny. <laughs> okay, the next stop is the mezzanine. The mezzanine houses uh, our latest awards, trophies, and photographs. Also 18th and 19th century French automatons. And uh, what else is up there? Oh, I mean, almost a thousand radiator hood ornaments, so lots to look at. <laughs> but look quickly but carefully. We're not on this level very long. We want to get up to the music room. The way we get up there is the beautiful grand staircase. The staircases here are low rise, so they're very easy to accommodate. Stay to the left, you'll have a lower stride. Use the rails, if not, Robert will bring you up in the elevator. Come on up. Yeah. 
there a collection of those similar to what you have here? Um, oh, yeah. the old ones? Oh, my gosh. We have thousands of them. Oh, okay. Like wow. Thousands of these. Mm. And these are wax. Well, they wear now. Well, now that they keep the stylus on so it's a, it's a diamond head. It's pretty good. It's nice. So it's a little rod. You have a problem. And if you play with the dirty, grind the dirty with the wax. Yeah. And you can crack this. It's like a blue awesome. bar of chocolate. It's just really mm -hmm. snap. Very fragile. Yeah. So I'm glad there are people who like to, uh, you know. Vinyl record. Well, it was, but he kept making these until 1929, even though the records came out in 1913. Right. He kept making these. Well, there's a lot of people had them. I'm assuming this is a common thing to have. It's just like the electric cars. You know, they're going to come out, and we're going to keep gas cars around for decades. So not everybody will get them. See the grooves in it. The label on the top. There's the year and the disc number. So they even had a catalog of them, which was pretty. Who knew? Huh? Hmm. You can come up a little closer. We are going up the staircase. You have a question. What is it, young lady? Um, what's up, uh, all this thing in this room? Oh, in this room? Me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I hide it well, thanks to Merle Norman, let me tell you. <laughs> and it's great. I use their shampoo. <laughs> well, one of you got it. Okay. <laughs> the most, the oldest thing in this room? The music box down at the end, and this one again right here. 1880s, 1890s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. That's pretty good. The Pony Express letter, is that older? The Pony Express letter is, uh, yes. It is older. Sorry. It doesn't belong here. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. It really doesn't belong here. Okay, any other questions? Okay, the next stop is finally the music room. And the music room houses an amazing collection of mechanical musical instruments, and I'm gonna play a lot of them for you. We're gonna start off with an American piece. Now, you've noticed I've emphasized American a few times. There's a reason. We really haven't invented that much, specifically in the world of music. We have phenomenal composers, arrangers, artists, but we did not invent the musical instruments they play on. Can any one of you name a genuine American musical instrument? Ukulele. The ukulele. No, it's from Portugal. Banjo. The banjo. No, it's from Africa. <laughs> the washboard. The washboard is from Sweden. The drum is from Africa. Electric guitar. Ooh, we have a winner. The electric guitar. Was that you? Yes. The electric. Free tickets for your next tour. Congratulations. <laughs> but wait, the, the electric guitar is a genuine American musical instrument, but this may surprise you. It had nothing to do with rock and roll music, nor did it have anything to do with modern day music. The guitar is from Spain. It's a Spanish musical instrument, and it's not very loud. It's for any of you that play acoustic guitar, you know it's not a very loud instrument. It's, it's beautiful but it's not loud. And when they were making the original recordings for the 19th, during the 1900s, for the 78 records, and the Thomas Edison wax cylinders, the guitar was not loud enough to be recorded acoustically. So, they amplified it. That's what it was for, classical music, and to play along with the early, uh, with, play along with the original banjos, and the music from the teens, 20s, and 30s, the one-step, two-step music. It was called the Rittenbach, electric guitar. It's 92 years old and it was invented, ready, in Fullerton, California. <laughs> it is a true California American musical instrument. It's a good, very good. Any other guesses? American musical instrument. 
<laughs> oh, you were just stretching. <laughs> and now breaking glass. <laughs> The theremin is not considered a musical instrument. It cannot oh, be really? Robert, because it cannot be played without electricity. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> okay. Yes. The theremin is an, a, a, an electrical wave musical instrument. So is the synthesizer. It's done with waves and electricity. So it's not considered a, an acoustic musical instrument. Oh, okay. Any other guesses? It's a German tuba. <clears throat> the tuba was invented in Germany. John Philip Sousa wanted the sound of the tuba in the marching parades. So you've all seen the Sousa and that huge brass instrument that you see, and that go, it, they can usually put a cover over it, and it just, it's wonderful. But it's still a German tuba that was just reshaped to be uh, walked with in a parade. You'll never see a Sousa in the orchestra, because the tuba is there instead. You see how few we have? How about the flute? The flute is ancient. <laughs> also European. Trombone, piano. Trombone Germany. G piano, Germany. Tambourine? Tambourine is from Romania. <laughs> yeah, keep them coming, kids. I got it. <laughs> I know a little bit about it. Okay. Yeah. Go away, Robert. Glass harmonica. The glass R Monica. Yes, we have another winner. Benjamin Franklin, the oldest American musical instrument, was invented by Benjamin Franklin himself. It's called the glass R Monica, A-R Monica. It's the nesting glass bowls that gradually get larger. They're in a tank, and there's water in the tank, and you, sp and you uh, spin the, the bowls with a treadle pedal down below, and you play the tops of the rims of the glass with your wet fingers. Wow. We've all done that with a wine glass. Yeah. Why not make one into 40? And you can note, remember the sound of just the one? Imagine a whole keyboard wow. of glass like that. It is stunning. So when you get home, do a YouTube or Google the glass harmonica and listen to it. It's hauntingly beautiful. Okay, that's pretty much it. But none of you guessed the most amusing. Someone just said it. Kazoo. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> the, the kazoo is a genuine American musical instrument. <laughs> And what a proud moment for the United States. <laughs> mm -hmm. But kids, it's not new. It's hundreds of years old. It had nothing to do with a, ch a child. It was out of boredom. Someone placed a piece of tissue paper over a hair comb. Tissue paper and comb was the very first kazoo. So you did pretty good. Actually, two out of the three, excellent. Okay, the first instrument I will play is American made, but not American invented, and that is a piano. It's a Nickelodeon piano. I have a nickel in my pocket. I'm going to pop the nickel in and play the Nickelodeon. That's where the name came from. And then after you enter the music room proper, another uh, 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 reproducing piano. This time it'll be three gentlemen, six hands. And this piano's from 1928. So the way you see it is magnificent. Now the way we get up there is this beautiful spiral and a half staircase. And even the staircase here has a name. It's called Stairway to the Stars, not Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> Not Stairway to Paradise, Stairway to the Stars. That was the very first Stairway song. Came out in 1929, and they loved to dance to it. So then in their honor, now in their memory, note for note, Stairway to the Stars, all the way up to the last step. It is 42 steps up, folks, so it's a bit of a crawl. Use the rail, stay to the right this time, and no sliding back down. <laughs> I did it once. <laughs> yeah, I got to know this sculpture rather intimately. <laughs> so, no sliding back down the stairs. If you choose not to walk, Robert will take you up in the elevator. And as you enter the music room to the right, down the hall are restrooms and water. Come on up.
But neither one of them were musicians. Neither were their two sons. So when they built this building, they had their architect, Anthony Heinzbergen, develop and, and design a music room just for them. So they could have music playing at all times and not have to rely on the live musicians, because they weren't. They also liked having people over for dinner. So in the design, they included a Louis XV dining room. It is an exact copy of a Louis XV era dining room, including the table and chairs. But the table and chairs are not antique. They were built locally here in the San Fernando Valley in 1971. But they are in the style of Louis XV. So if you look very carefully at each chair, something's missing. <laughs> the left arm. The one-arm chair existed during that time period, 16 and 1700s, because of what a gentleman wore with his formal attire. Swords, sabers were worn to the left, so there's no arm on that side of the chair. The chandelier above the table is the oldest item in our collection. It is genuine, bless you. It is genuine Louis XV, and it has been time-stamped in the year 1680. It is genuine and is royal. It was not electrified until we hung it over the table in 1972. When you come into the dining room in a moment, take a look into one of our mirrors. Turn exactly around and look into the opposite mirror, and you'll see an infinity of chandeliers. It's a beautiful optical illusion. And then after a while, uh, one of my docents will lower the lights in the, in, the, uh, in the ceiling. Come and look in the mirrors again, and you'll see how the chandelier must have looked hundreds of years ago with candlelight. So it's a rare opportunity. Take advantage of it. It's really pretty. Now, as you look around, I'm going to play a lot of music for you. You've heard from two reproducing pianos. You've heard from a wax cylinder player, a Nickelodeon at the top of the stairs, and mechanical boxes. But there's one type of instrument we've not yet exposed you to, and they're surrounding you all the way around the room. Every one of these incredible cabinets is a self-contained orchestra. They're called orchestrians. Orchestrians date from 1800 to around 1940, built primarily in Germany and Belgium, and they stayed in Europe, which is why we sadly didn't really know them here. Designed for indoor use to provide the music for dancing and for entertainment. No two look alike, nor do they sound alike, because they were designed for the venue they were placed in. So can you imagine what some of these places must have looked like? Wow. Some of them were even at homes. This was a very common piece to have in your great manor houses throughout Europe as a self-playing pipe organ. Now I'm going to give you a good sampling of these incredible machines, including one on the first album built by Hupfeld of Leipzig, Germany, 1911, which makes it 112 years old. This machine, folks, is going to play for you all by itself three violins accompanied live on a piano. A violin, one of the hardest instruments to pick up and play, and to master a violin could take anyone a lifetime. Here's a machine, 112 years old, that's gonna play three of them simultaneously. This was the genius of man's mind and his hands that built these great machines, folks. Not his thumbs. <laughs> his hands. So please encourage yourself and the younger folks to put the thumbs away and get to know these. They miss you. Now, you're probably going to, wondering what powers these machines. Here it is in one word, air. It's all done with air. Pipe organs and pipes have to be blown. Positive air. Piano keys have to fall. Something has to draw them. Suction, vacuum, negative air. So in each one of these machines are bellows. When the bellows open, it's sucking the air in. When the bellows close, it's pushing the air out. So every time the bellows open and close, it creates the positive and negative air to power these machines. That's all it is, folks, is air. After the violin plays, I'll play the Hugo Popper in the center of the room over there. Uh, Popper was built in 1923 in Leipzig, Germany. Five of this model were made. It's called the Gladiator, named after the, the Roman soldiers because of the strength and power. The uh, Four of them were destroyed. They were bombed out in World War II. So this is the only one left in the world. Once these machines grew out of favor because the jukebox was invented, they no longer needed these machines, so they brought the jukebox in. They couldn't get rid of it because it was part of the structure of the cafe. This was in Brussels. So they painted it white every time they painted the cafe, so it had five coats of white house paint on it. Oh. 
they took the, the uh, statuette out and they also removed the lighting and hung a dartboard there in its place. <laughs> and when it, someone had bad aim, the darts went into the cabinet. So when we acquired it, we brought it here and it was agreed upon, do not erase history, folks. It's part of its past. It's part of its story. Learn from it, enjoy it, or never do it again. Don't erase history. So we left the holes in the cabinet because that's part of its story. The last machine will be the great big one over here against the wall in the center, called Photon. Built in 1904 in Freiburg, Germany. It was commissioned to be built for a very large ballroom in Hamburg. The ballroom can hold 2,000 people. That's a lot of people to access with using that machine alone. It lasted for several years, and it was so big it was built on site. The ballroom went out of favor, and so it was converted into a bowling alley. So from tap shoes to bowling shoes. Well, when we went searching for Votan in the late 1960s, no one at the bowling alley knew anything about it. It was long gone. We had the only photographs of it. So we were just about to leave, and this is a documented, factual story. The cleaning lady comes running after our buyer. She said, I think I know what you're looking for. She took him back into the bowling alley, up a little service staircase, into her broom closet. She parted the brooms and the mops and the moldy dustpans, and there was an 18-inch rectangular hole in the wall. She says, look in there. There he was. No one knew anything about it because it had been walled in for so many years. It was out of sight, out of mind. So they agreed to sell it to us for one condition. The wall could not come down. Well, that didn't stop us. We're clever. We cut it into 18-inch rectangular strips and brought it through the opening, hundreds of pieces, oh my God. back to the United States, restored it so we could play its story and its music one more time. Wow. It is the only one ever made, folks. It was so big, they just could not remove it. So people come from all over the world, from the music world and the mechanic musical world, just to see this machine because of its incredible history and past. And it's, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, its story is amazing. So after he finishes, join me at the organ console in the center of the room. I'm gonna personally demonstrate that beast and we're gonna get a live concert out of her too. When you come into the dining room, this is the only furniture we ask you not to come in contact with is the table and chairs. Restrooms and water are down the hall that direction. And when you hear those violins come running, they don't play for very long. Come in and take a look. How many chandeliers do you see? Amazing. Simply amazing. Let's go.
orchestrates now. Nice. nice. Aren't they wonderful? Yes. It's kind of hard not to. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to, and you think, ah, but that's what they were for. Sadly, we didn't have these here in the States. So the way we got our entertainment through the same time period was called the movie theater. And that's where we went then, that's where we go now for entertainment. We go to see a movie. And there's some pretty decent ones out there now. Not all of them, but there's some pretty decent ones available. But when you went to see a movie over 150 years ago, and yes, they're now that old, folks. That's a little scary. 150 years old. There was no sound. There wouldn't be sound in the motion picture theater until 1928-29, with the premiere of the very first successful sound movie, Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer. But prior to that breakthrough, the sounds and the music were live. Real musicians, male and female, would sit in those very dark, very smoky, and sometimes very cramped movie theaters all over the world and hand play for movies. Some theaters did have a live orchestra, but that was extremely rare because of the cost and space. So the majority of theaters either had a piano or one of these. This is the mighty Wurlitzer Theater pipe organ. It's also a genuine American musical instrument. It was built and created specifically to accompany silent movies. So it didn't have a very long life. Yes, the pipe organ itself is ancient. It's even in the Bible in many, many, mentioned several times. But the theater pipe organ is fairly new. And when the talkies came in, the last one was built in 1935 and the majority of these organs were destroyed. There was no need for them anymore. So they were, a lot of them ended up in churches, and then in the 60s there was a resurgence, and a lot of them went into pizza parlors across the country. There's still quite a few of them left. It's a lot of fun. So we're very protective of this old gal, because March 1st, she'll turn 105 years old. Mm -hmm. She played for the first time, March 1st, 1918, at the Denver Municipal Auditorium in Denver, Colorado. Now, when we first started the tour, I introduced myself to you as the curator of the collection and also master technician. But there's something I haven't shared with you all, the true love of my life. I am a concert organist. So I get the thrill of playing her every day prior to the tours, and that's how I learn what needs to be done to take care of her. So here's her story, folks. It is a pipe organ. You just don't see it because you're standing inside of it. Surrounding you in all four walls, over your head and under your feet, is the third largest theater pipe organ in the world waiting to play right now if you thought these were big. They have less than 200 each. This is 5,132 organ pipes at the ready right now to play for you. They range in size. The smallest pipe is going to be the highest note. Our smallest pipe is a quarter of an inch long, which is the size of the pink erasers on your yellow number two pencils. It's that small. And if that sound is so high, I'm playing it right now. A lot of you will not be able to hear it. If you're over 50. No, that's, uh, don't be offended. Uh, I don't know yet. I still, never mind. We tend to lose high frequencies in our hearing. It's a natural phenomenon. Please don't feel bad. If you can hear it, great. If you can't, great. But every dog is running towards this building right now. Now that's the highest. The lowest isn't in inches. It's in feet. Our longest pipe is 33 feet long and almost 40 inch square. Let me see. The three of you ladies could stand inside of it oh, wow. while it plays. It's cool. Wow. When it goes off, yeah. and they're mounted along this wall. One of those pipes is so powerful, it moves this entire building. Who <laughs> that you know? I do. Wow. All 5,000. Sure. Every Tuesday and Wednesday. <laughs> it's true. Wow. That's just one pipe, folks. Is it straight miles. or is it curved? It goes straight up to the fifth floor. Oh, wow. And it's eight cycles. So that won't come out on your recording. No. You can't record it. Under 20 hertz. <coughs> so in addition to the pipes, though, are sound effects. Each one of these little white buttons is directly attached to sound effects. Now, I'm going to play these sound effects, but re uh, remind me, folks, how old is the organ? 105. 105. There is no MIDI, no recordings, no amplification, no speakers, and no microphones because none of that stuff existed yet. So these sounds that I'm about to play are real and they are 105 years old. They're also very generic. So one sound, if you're clever during a movie, can make several things during one movie come to life. Okay? So here we go. 1917, Tarzan premiered. 
The opening scene of Tarzan, the silent movie, shows a man crawling up a rocked staircase to ring a very large gong to summon the beast. We have that very gong. <laughs> so when we're watching the movie, though, I have to find the right button, but I have to watch the movie screen because when he strikes that gong, <laughs> so do I. That's real, folks. Listen to the mechanism. 30-inch brass gong struck by a 100-pound, 100 100-psi 100 pneumatic hammer. 105 years old. Would you like to hear a steamboat whistle? Yeah. Would you like to hear a toy train? Yeah. <laughs> Avalanche warning? Doorbell. Telephone. Refill my Starbucks. Fire. There's the alarm. Where's the fire truck? What is it that powers these machines? Air. Yeah. Guess what powers this? Air. That's all it is, folks, is air. Thunder. Earthquake. <laughs> Avalanche. <laughs> My stomach before lunch. <laughs> How about a train? The bell's hanging right on the wall. folks, the majority of the world still had not seen a car. Oh. So when they went to the movies, they saw their first cars, and they also got to hear the first <laughs> car horn. Do any of you know what that horn is called? Ooga, ooga. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> klaxon. Yes. Congratulations. It's called Klaxon. The car was invented in Germany, right? So therefore, it has a German name for a horn. Klaxon means noisemaker. Oh, uh, ooga. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Wind and rain. <laughs> Tarzan premiered in 1918. Yes, Tarzan was that old. It was a silent movie, so these organs had sound effects. Animals, here's the birds. It's nothing too special. It's a cup of glycerin which is thicker than water. There's an organ pipe on the surface blowing bubbles. That's bubbles. Huh. Police whistle. A horse. Yes, it's coconut shells brought together by air. And if I wanted to whistle at all these pretty ladies. <laughs> drums. Here's how it works, folks. Do any of you know what these controls are called on an organ console? Yeah. They're called stops. The original pipe organs in Europe, and literally in the year 1000, you pulled the stops out, or pulled the delivers out, and they stopped. So they called them stops. So if I turned every one of them on, that'd be quite a cacophony of sound, wouldn't it? Have you ever heard the old expression, pull all the stops out? Guess where it came from? The pipe organ console. We're gonna pull all the stops out. That's where it came. So, being that this is not in the organ, it's, a, it's attached at a distance away from the organ, it had to be electrified. So this is common. This is 105 years old. 12 volt DC, car guys and gals. A car battery, not a Prius, could actually power this organ console. It's 12 volt DC. So everything I touch sends a signal from the console into the organ. 105 years old. And once it reaches its destination, in this case the snare drum, then air takes over. So all I have to do is play one key, and I'm sending the signals. 